Welcome, everybody. Uh, no, we've got about 20 by now, 2022. Um, welcome, everyone, to the NIOF webinar today. It's the 20th of October. I'd like to introduce you all before we start to one of the gentlemen of this business, I do have to say. I say freely and openly with pleasure. This is Daniel Biaggi, the General Director of Palm Beach Opera. Welcome, everyone. A great pleasure to be here with you all. Wonderful. Now, before we start, as people are signing on, let me get you uh, some information quickly to kind of, uh, uh, so that you will know kind of what's going on here. If you notice, there's a chat screen that's to the left of, of, of the screen where you see Daniel and I. Everything you write in there will be shared with everyone. Essentially, you can just write to us when you have your questions. Ruben, if you see Ruben Costas, We'll be kind of dealing with uh, with the questions as they're written throughout the, the webinar. So feel free to answer things, follow up with things, share things between each other. It's perfectly fine. Think of this as, as kind of a living room discussion, a coffee talk, shall we say, um, about the industry. The, the goal of these things is for this to be enjoyable and casual and for, for you to feel like you you can get the information that you need without having to worry about pretenses and and other issues. So feel free to completely interact throughout this process. Um, the other thing that will be happening about every 10 minutes through here is just little series of, of polls. There's just little a question will pop up on your screen. You have 15 or 20 seconds to just choose one of the answers. It's nothing that's major, but it's information that helps us better focus these webinar series to help you, which is which is the goal of these series. I remember when I was a student, a singing student, what was fascinating to me is how there seemed to be a very big wall between the information that you were given as a student and what you needed to have to be successful as a professional. And there didn't seem to be a very easy connection and a very easy bridge between those two things to provide you the information you need to function as a professional, not just in the United States, not just in Europe, but in the world. There really isn't, there aren't that many markets left. There's kind of one market and it's the world these days. And so we set these up so that we could start getting you the information directly from the people that make the decisions. You can't get better information than asking the people that actually cast, why they cast this, why they cast that. Then you get the information straight from the source. So these polls will pop up, and they're going to help us better focus these uh, webinar series for you. So just answer quickly, and after about 15, 20 seconds, it will disappear. It's not going to take a lot of time. So <clears throat> now we've talked about the screen. We've talked about this. Um, in general, I think we have uh, everything that we need to do here. So let me tell you first, I've introduced you to Daniel, but let me tell you a little bit about him because he's really an amazing, amazing uh, resource for us and for you as artists. Daniel trained, first he is Swiss, but he's been living in the United States for a number of years. So he knows both sides of the ocean very well. The Swiss part is good because he can speak every known language pretty much. <laughs> then, on top of that, he is a trained singer. He went to school and got degrees as a singer and auditioned and pursued a career as a singer. After that time, he got a job working as an agent in New York, and he worked for several years as an agent um, with Guy Barzilay artists out of New York City. During that time, you were also teaching diction, I know, at Manhattan School, but also at another university in... Uh, yeah. Manus, Sarah Lawrence, and Juilliard every now and then. Oh my gosh, so, yeah, thank great. you. Yeah. <laughs> then he got the job as artistic administrator. Um, are we having trouble? I'm seeing here that we're having trouble with sound. Um, can everybody just check in that, that you hear us, um, what we can do as far as sound goes? Your Gita, what I'm Going. I'm trying to look here. Okay. Slowly we're getting that people can't hear. Um, okay. okay. Let me 
C. Um, okay, I'm wondering if, if it has something to do in any way. Some people seem to be able to hear and some people can't. If you cannot hear, um, let me write this. Um, okay, it, it, some of the sound may have to do with, uh, uh, some of the sound may have to do with internet speed wherever you are. That's entirely possible as well, but it might be helped if you kick off of the, off of the webinar and come right back in. It's not going to be a problem. The same link will work for you. You just have to close the window and then follow the link again and open a new window. To continue quickly with Daniel, he began a job as the Artistic Administrator, Director of Artistic Operations at Palm Beach Opera doing the casting. And from that point, he actually rose to the ranks to be the General Director of the Opera Company. So he truly is one of, one of the people in this business that has seen every single side of the table um, and knows every single bit of it. So let's go ahead and drop and start in with this. Um, the first thing that I would like to ask just to start things going is from where you sit and all of the angles that you see um, when you think about opera, what do you think the state of the business is internationally now and how does that apply to the work that you do in Palm Beach and the audiences that you that you program for there? probably the most important question of the day in the end. And I do think the, uh, a lot of has been said about it. I do think the business is a little bit in a stage of transition, um, but I think there, um, there also needs to be just a big sense of faith in the art form. I think there's, there, we have to make a big distinction between um, the art form opera itself and the opera business on the other hand. I think there are too many too many attempts right now to redefine and reinvent everything for the sake of finding new audiences without trusting the fact that opera will always work for some and not for others, and that's okay. And um, with that in mind, I think it's, uh, I actually find it quite healthy. I know people are concerned. I know companies are struggling financially, um, but I do think that uh, in general, it's, it's always been a little bit of an up and down and it's very well possible that right now is a little bit of period of reinvention, but that in the sense that probably more so than ever, a lot of operatic initiatives take place outside of the opera house, and so not only in the opera house, especially in the States, in terms of uh, getting new audiences to, to give opera a try. And I think that's very important, but I think we just have, have to trust in in the the innate power of one unamplified voice speaking to the other to another human being, and base it on that. Mm -hmm. Do you, what have you found? I mean, this is a good question. One of the first things that that uh, Enrique just uh, just asked, which is also a big hot topic these days, which is the beautiful model type singers. Uh, and gr as opposed to great voices. Now, of course, everybody wishes to say we're, you know, 19-year-old Anna Moffo singing, uh, singing uh, Madame Butterfly, but the reality is, is there does seem to be a lot of talk that is very much based on how people look, even more than sometimes these days than how people sound. What's your sense of that as far as how you deal with it at Palm Beach and how you deal with it when you see it in other places? Um, I think on one hand, unfortunately, it's quite true. On the other hand, I think it is the biggest problem that we've created. And I say we in the sense that every general director creates the problem by wanting to brag to your own audiences that you say, oh, we, our opera singers look like the roles they're playing. They are young. They're good looking. They are active on stage, they're, they're very physical, they, are, they can easily take their shirts off and look great. But I do mm -hmm. think, um, we've, you know, we, uh, I think every now and then 
fortunately, we're a relatively traditional opera company. And I, I really mean fortunately by the sense that it allows us to focus on voice. And I have to be very honest, I found myself uh, flipping. I found myself switching sides. Um, while I will absolutely admit that I would, uh, of course, uh, encourage everyone to take care of themselves, to be healthy, to uh, work out, to stay physically active, um, and to make a good visual impression every time they sing. I have to admit that I'm now at the point where I feel it's the, the pendulum has swung too far over. There are too mm -hmm. many young things who, who, on their own part, worry about being one of the Barry Hunks or making the top 10 hot list of tenors and spend their time in the gym instead of in the practice room. And it gets to mm -hmm. the point where we, where in auditions, it's, it's now a matter of, um, we really, you know, I, again, I would, I would encourage people to be healthy, but quite honestly, I would encourage everyone not to try to look like a model because your voice is not going to sustain it. You're not going to have the career you think you will because of the fact that you have a short-lived career while you're young and hot, so to speak. Um, but I would much rather have someone who's in good shape but has, a, has an elastic body, who has a little bit of mm -hmm. substance to the body that can function on a big stage. Um, not few Few singers will have a career based on film and based on HD broadcast and based on transmission. Most singers will still have their career because of the live impact they make. And, mm -hmm. and that would work if the singing is not paramount. If, not, if the singing is not working, then the body alone will not give, it, give you the career. I guess what would be I interesting mean, we, we for survive. me following... No, no, no. Well, what would be interesting is following up with that of saying that, that because you say if the singing's not working, then having a perfect body isn't going to necessarily work for you. But what I would say, especially, forgive me for this, but if I'm speaking from the European side of things, there's a very large amount of wiggle room in what singing not working actually means sometimes. Um, and more and more what you see, I remember they just announced that, that Covent Garden is going to live stream their entire season, just like the Met does. Scala is already now live streaming their entire season. You've got more and more theaters, every one of them. And I think actually, didn't you tell me that you guys actually do, uh, do you actually stream now in the, in the parks down, uh, downtown or do you do live performance there? We decided to do live performances. We have done some uh, live streaming of the one hour and one hour series, not yet the ones mm -hmm. on the main stage. Okay. But, even but with now, more and more video less... streaming, then you're talking about singing for the video, singing for the microphone, singing for the close up on the camera, not singing necessarily for the theater. What's, what's your feeling about that and the way that people start to choose singers? The same way that Deutsche Grammophon chooses people for how they record as opposed to how they sound sometimes. Right. Well, see, but again, even, even so, I think there's a, there's a difference if we're talking about someone who's really overweight and unhealthily so and therefore cannot move on stage and is not able to to sustain the physical desires of, of a director because of then otherwise not being able to sing versus someone who is a little bit rounder than than a model you don't want to be a size zero you don't want your 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 physical body to be totally tight and mm -hmm. i think even with even with close-ups if you can't sing these parts it's not going to last in the end i honestly believe that you know maybe right now we're in a in a in a period where that's given precedence, and but it it will very very quickly become evident that the the career span of a singer goes from 25 years to 10 years if uh, it's all based on looks, and I think that will be a wake up call enough for the industry to realize that it doesn't work that way. No, oh, I I would agree. I would agree. So well, what, to kind of a little bit transition from there into a couple of the things. Um, let's kind of, I'm sure we will come back to these things because they are kind of the hot topics that everyone's talking about these days. But what would you say uh, for young singers that are transitioning into a career, 
what steps do you think uh, are the best that one would need to follow? What, what do you want to focus on? What things do you need to make sure are lined up? And what are those first steps between school and trying to find a career? What would you suggest? Right. Um, well, number one, honestly, is technique. If, if, and I think it's, unfortunately, uh, a lot of singers have been uh, told to sort of hurry up and to, because of this very fast-paced world we live in, to look for the next gig immediately, to look for the Young Artist Program, to start going immediately and not wait until they feel they're ready. But I think every singer has to be really honest with themselves and figure out how secure they feel vocally. Um, uh, 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 young artist programs are great, but few young artist programs can offer you the vocal guidance that a young singer may need. They can offer you the musical guidance, the dramatic guidance. They can give you work experience and, and real life experience in the theater. But if you uh, get into a young artist program and are not technically at a point where you, by on your own, can always get yourself to the point where it feels right and is healthy, then any five, six month young artist program at the end of the season will only have hurt you rather than helped you if you then go down the wrong path technically. So I do think that, although of course it's always a work in progress, but I think there's mm -hmm. not enough focus on just singing well and just unapologetically singing opera. Stand, plant yourself there and sing. And don't, from the beginning, mm -hmm. try to find shortcuts for the sake of getting hired. And if it's, if it's not right yet, then for the sake of long-term uh, career, I would much rather advise someone to stay in the city for a year or stay with a teacher who you trust for another year or two, work on the side, put everything into singing, instead of running from audition to audition, trying to get into what you see as the next step. I really believe that the, the, the technical ability at any given time of the day to know that within a half hour of warming up, I can get myself into the state that it's always consistent, always healthy, is, is uh, uh, step number one. Mm -hmm. And assume that you come out of school, which, which we all know that everybody is going to have to, everybody has to keep studying in my opinion. I mean, when I was at Manhattan School of Music, I worked for Dolores Ogic for five years. And this is somebody that was literally at the very top of her game, still is at the very top of this career. And until the day that her primary lifelong voice teacher died, she still went and had voice lessons on a regular basis because she said she can always fine tune this or polish that. So I think that the technique is something that has to constantly be worked on. But then Assume that you're getting out of there. What is the repertoire? Like some, like uh, we were asked earlier. I think Mary asked earlier. Say you're coming out. She's a she's a, a a lighter soprano. She's based in Italy, it seems, and she's she likes to do things like Lucia. Yet, as a a singer that's trying to start a career, or somebody that doesn't have big credits, and they come in singing a long list of Lucia, Violetta, Maria Stuarda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, is that repertoire that actually helps you get a foothold? What, what do you feel as far as offering the big girls or offering a difference of repertoire? What do you feel works best these days? I think it's, this is the same thing there. The, the question that the singer really, really honestly has to ask him or herself is to figure out what is right for the voice. It doesn't matter I would I would never try to tailor the repertoire around what you think people want to hear you sing. Oh, you, I think you yeah. must be very, very honest with yourself and see what works for your own voice. And 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 also, you know, I think when you're there's a tendency when you're in the beginning of it, and when you come right out of school, if we're still talking about this transition period now, to have this idea that I need to, I need to also show people where I'm going, which is something I oh. completely disagree with, because I, if someone comes in and is not, especially when you're singing for people who are casting for young artist programs or for competitions or for anyone who who wants to take you seriously as a as an artist, and these roles are only showing the flaws of where you're not quite there yet. 
then it really yeah. serves absolutely no purpose. So I don't I don't believe in singing one fach bigger showing oh I'm 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 moving into this. My voice is intended for big mature roles. I'm still too young for it, but I think this is where I'm going to go. I oh I I believe that anyone should should I would much rather hear a a a, a heavier voice or a larger voice and a, in a one step smaller repertoire than someone who has so that there's always a sense of singing on on um, the, the 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 capital only never on the interest so to speak so there's always a little bit of a reserve and there are right now there are way too many singers who come into auditions who sing at the top of their lungs and you can feel them pushing and shoving and uh, for lack of better terms screaming their way through an aria and it, it, mm -hmm. it won't do them any good. Maybe in five years, sure. But same thing there. Have the courage to do exactly where you are at this point. And trust that the people who will hear you will be smart enough to figure out where that voice is going. Not everybody in the business will be able to do that or take the time to think about the voice that much. But that's out of your control to begin with. Uh-huh. Now, now you, you mentioned one thing that sticks in my mind when you said uh, singing one step bigger than where you are now. I hear constantly, I have to say, that I hear, um, uh, I hear constantly that people say that in Europe they cast everything one step lighter than they do in the U.S., which would, of course, assume that that means that in the U.S. they cast everything one step heavier than in Europe. In your experience of having heard people all around, let's take Fjordeligi as kind of that bass middle rep. Do you find that who sings Fjordeligi in in Europe is going to be different than who would be cast for Fjordeligi in the U.S.? And would that mean that a Fjordeligi in the U.S. would be a Desdemona in Europe? How, how do you feel about that difference? Um, I I would hesitate to generalize it to that extent. Uh, I can imagine that a part of it is true, uh, partially be, uh, probably because of the type of productions, because of the size of the houses, because of the, mm -hmm. the, the sort of the, the interest into the singers, where a lot of people in the States obviously say, well, sorry, we have to hear them first, and we want to make sure that they, that the American audiences who are maybe a little bit more trained for uh, high, loud, and fast, rather than rather than um, uh, hearing all the nuances uh, are better served with a larger voice. But we've, mm -hmm. we have, um, I mean, you know, our house is, is 2,200 seats. It's relatively good acoustics. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think it's easy to sing in. And we've brought over many, um, uh, many artists from Europe who sing the same roles in Europe as they did with us. So I, I, I wouldn't say that Categorically, one could one can um, make that kind of a general statement, but again, I'm sure it's true in some instances in, in smaller houses in Europe. A, a couple of the questions that have come in now kind of generally tend to point towards one uh, one thing, which is the concept of, of more mature singers as opposed to young artists, babies that are just just popping out of school. Um, where one of the questions was, one of us, that, for those of us that might be too old for a young artist program, and voices also, different voices that take a little more time to fill out, a little more time to become ready. Um, how, how do, how does the business and how do you feel uh, that to deal with people that aren't going to come in and be the next 22 year old out there, people that are adults? that took a little while to grow or that have have been around have been singing or have been living their life for a while and they're coming at this more in with an intact voice but but not uh, but more mature in their life how do you where is the place for those people in the business these days how do you utilize them and what can they do to be better utilized or find better opportunities Well, certainly, first of all, there, of course, there's a place. And I think it's, it is, it's just the, the unfortunate reality that it, you will never know whether and what your place is as you wait for that place to manifest. Um, I, mm -hmm. You and I both know plenty of singers who just had to stick it out, 
who had larger voices, who couldn't get into in any of the young artist programs because they weren't serviceable at that point. And where mm -hmm. same thing there, if you you just have to have the 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 gut to stick to it and continuously, uh, and and then I think it will work itself out because quite honestly, if someone, uh, so if if in our case, if someone comes in, sings an audition, um, seems to have not quite as much experience on their resume, but sings it really well and is now right for that particular voice, then of course we're going to consider that singer and probably hire that singer over someone else who's had five, ten more roles on the re on the repertoire list if the if the voice is not right of the other one. So, but but same thing there. I think you you have to while you wait. Um, you have to maintain a sense of, uh, I guess you have to sort of find your own center and sense of gratefulness for still being in it, a sense of the fact that that still makes you happy and not turn into the bitter singer who feels like you wait and wait and wait. And if, if you do and it, it's intended to be, then it will happen. Um, it's the unfortunate reality that there's, there's, there is no clear-cut path. Um, competitions can be a big help because there it's not so much about fitting a whole program. It's not about the whole role. It's more about, uh, or often more about one aria or two. Um, and then just to, you know, I think if if you continue to keep, if you find your five people who are um, uh, who are who you can trust, and as long as you continue to. Um, uh, Pay attention to what they're saying and be very honest with yourself of how you're developing. Then, even a voice that takes more time to mature will catch the attention of the people in the business. There are not that many singers who can sing the more dramatic roles. And if a singer lets his or her voice mature healthily, they will catch the attention of the people in the profession. Uh huh. Um... But so then a question is is this is because I mean this a little from my personal experience and other things that we can that we can talk about here is um, when someone comes in to sing potentially when uh, and they don't have a lot of experience say it's one of these singers that the voice has taken a little while to develop. And they don't. They have now worked on their technique, worked on their presentation, and they're going to come in and offer big things or whatever. But they don't really have experience at all. One of the things that kind of sticks with me is the fact that when you hear someone sing, there is an innate sense of knowing if they're going to be able to carry a show or be on stage in the way that we need them to be. Um, how do you reconcile the fact that what is it about if you hear somebody sing an audition that lets you know that, you know what, I can take a chance on this person, even though they have no experience professionally? Ah, uh, good question. I think it's a, um, it's, it, it, it's a sense of inner strength that you get from a singer, a sense of inner calm, of realizing that he or she is at the at the right place at the right time, and then you can take a chance like that. The the other, um, you know, one other way to which I think is still um, used even even for us, even if if we don't have that many, is is to cover. And I find there are a lot of singers who are um, who are too proud to cover, who feel it's their turn, and who feel. Why would I do that? Why should I waste my time covering? Whereas on one hand, you learn a tremendous amount exactly in regard to stamina in terms of pacing these heavier roles in terms of seeing how other other singers um, work around it and, uh, and are able to be part of a production to see your way into it. Um, and you never know. You may jump in. You may sing a re rehearsal. You may sing a performance. So why would you not allow yourself the chance if that role is the one that you should be working on, then why wouldn't you cover it? You might even offer to a house to be their cover, right? I mean, you you you, uh. you might even say, look, I understand you cast the role. 
May I be a study cover? Is there a place for that? Is there a way that I could work with one or two or three of your music staff so that if anything happens to you, you might be able to use me, right? Very interesting. I, I think few singers do that. Few singers proactively approach a theater and say, look, I know you're doing this. Is it possible that I could be a, a cover to be considered? It, it's always helpful to know who is where. And again, if these roles are 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 right for you, then people will pay attention. So then the question would be, if we're talking about, let's kind of get into other things, when we talk about how important is a CV, how important is all of these things, how do you, um, how do we get in front of a theater to offer covering? Because we all know that you can't just simply write an email and say, hi, I was on the, the NIAP webinar, and I would love to just offer to be your cover. Or you can't just write an agency or any given theater and say, you know what, give me some coachings and I'll cover for you. They have to hear you. And getting even just getting into an audition is pretty darn hard in general with an agent, let alone without an agent. So how do how do you do that? How do you get in front of somebody to offer those type of things, do you suggest? Well, I think in many ways it happens not via the leadership of the theater, but via the music staff. And in the beginning, oh. you may have to pay every now and then and say, look, I really would like to call one of the big uh, repetiteurs or coaches or voice teachers mm -hmm. or, or assistant conductors of a, of a theater and tell them that you would like to have a consultation with them, uh, not necessarily mm -hmm. an audition so they don't so they don't feel that you're there just for the sense of, uh, please give me a job, but really <laughs> that you honestly want, want to learn something from them and ask them to to uh, have a consultation, think through the roles. If they hear something that will make them, you know, perk up their ears, they will take it back to the theater. They will then go to the to the conductor or the music head of music staff or the casting director and say, hey, by the way. I was approached by so and so. I worked with them for an hour. It was really quite impressive. They may still be young. They don't have a lot on their resume, but the way they interacted in a working session led me to believe that they have something to say. So that's uh -huh. that, that's maybe another way of of setting a little bit in the budgeting process of a young singer of trying to figure out where do you spend your money, um, uh -huh. what goes into voice lessons, what goes into coaching. Maybe every now and then, instead of having a coaching with the coach you've worked with for a long time, try to get one session with someone who's at the theater, if otherwise you don't have that access. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, so then uh, another thing that's come up a couple of times is, is discuss the effect of competitions. I know that you have said on the panel of the Tucker competition, you, you and Palm Beach had one of the major competitions in, in the United States for some time, and I know that we've talked about the possibility that it may be coming back, um, and you've sat on other panels around, what are the effects of competitions? And given the fact that, I mean, I have to say, on a personal note, I've, I've also sat on panels of many of them, and I also, as a singer, thought that many of them were rigged, and in my experience, only one time did I see something that, that would have kind of led me to think that there was already a decision made about who should be winning. However, uh, over certainly in Italy, absolutely, that is much more the case than most other places. But what about the place of competitions uh, for a singer that's trying to establish themselves? Whether they're young, whether they're, whether they're you know, more mature, it doesn't matter. I think they're, um, they're very important. I, I would suggest that people sing competitions. Some are good competition singers, some are not. Uh, some, for some, it's not their path. But I think they're very important, and not only because of who wins or who doesn't. And in that sense, um, you know, again, if you're the winner of a competition, it's great to go on a resume. But the point of being in the competition is to be heard by the whole panel. And mm -hmm. it has happened several times that while... Um, maybe a singer didn't win one of the major prizes. Um, she or he caught the attention of one of the panelists and was then uh, offered a, a job or a, a role out of that competition, even though, even though they didn't win. So I think there's, if you approach the competition from the standpoint that you are, uh, that you present yourself to a panel, not necessarily about I have to win because of the money. The money is great. 
but the impression you make is much more important. You may not be ready to win, and yes, it may be rigged, and yes, there may be other factors that play into a certain competition. Um, although mm -hmm. I have to say that I, I've, not, I've not been on panels where I felt that the uh, the outcome was was wasn't honestly discussed and 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 come to in mm -hmm. the end. Um, but I think you same thing there. You have to sing them, but you must not focus on the result. Uh, whether uh -huh. it's one, two, or three, makes no difference. And quite honestly, then, um, even if you sorry, I'll just finish this thought. Even uh -huh. if you're the the winner of a competition, it still means nothing because if from the competitions where you know that there are certain people who exert heavy influence over the uh, uh, the placement of the singers, you also don't trust them as a professional. Therefore, there's it really does not make any it it really does not make any um, difference. Um, whether you, you can on your resume say I won this competition if everybody knows that exactly this competition is not to be trusted. So it's much more important to keep in mind the whole panel rather than a particular place. Uh -huh. you, you mentioned one thing which I think is a very important thing not to let go of, which is you said from the beginning, if you're a good competition singer, in the sense that if you're not a good competition singer, then what does that actually mean do you see what i mean well yeah well i mean i i can say i was a terrible competition singer i i sang okay. some competitions but it it's never what i was never good at the i always enjoyed the rehearsal process the the i even auditions i thought were much better than this additional sort of i must be the winner of the competition didn't work for me and so mm -hmm. um that's what i mean i mean there are certain singers who and there you just be honest with yourself and say, look, I'm, I'm not so much the competition person, so don't don't focus too much on it. Uh -huh. In the end, there are there are also major talents who have never won a competition. I, it, it goes the other way around as well. There are major opera singers who have never been in a competition, never won a competition. And there are others who win the first 10 competitions they enter, and in two years, the career is done. You, you, you just, uh -huh. I, I know this is a terrible statement to make, but you just cannot allow the, your self-worth to be as a, your self-worth as a singer to be determined by outside factors. And I know it's terribly, terribly hard because that's how we, that's how you get the, the, the sense of I'm being appreciated. I have a place in this world as a singer. I'm getting work. I'm being hired. I'm being rehired. But you cannot allow your self-esteem or self-worth to be affected in any way by that. Uh huh. Now let's uh, let's take a little bit uh, of a turn with this. Now auditioning for agents, uh, uh, auditioning for agents in the U.S. as opposed to auditioning for agents in Europe. From your experience having been a manager, what is the what is the difference in the process? What do people look for differently? How did you look for it differently as a European that definitely has European sens sensibilities working in the US? Um well I think there's there's a greater obviously if if you're just in quotes, just casting, you're looking for very specific things. When when I was working as a, an artist manager, um the the palette of what becomes uh, interesting to an artist manager is much greater. So it allowed us to to have, um, in many ways, uh, take much more time with the singers. We always wanted to find out. Uh, I think you can be more more um, you can walk in and be a little bit more vulnerable when you're working with an artist manager. You can say, look, I'm not quite sure yet if if this is what I should be singing. I think if you're singing for management, I think it's perfectly okay to say, look, here are these five arias or six arias. Those I feel are right. Those I'm not quite sure yet. How do you hear it? I can only tell you what I feel when I sing these roles. So that mm -hmm. the artist manager from the beginning has, a, has a, something to work with with the singer, which actually gives you a lot of insight into, on one hand, the professionalism of the singer, the preparation of that particular singer, the, the their their mindset whether they are um, whether they are interested in, in in exploring different ways of of going about the career or whether they are um, so stuck on I want to be Violetta number one that uh, if then you don't agree then you know that's not going to work out. 
Uh-huh. Um, I do think it's much more a working a working relationship from the very beginning with an artist manager where you should where I I w- if I was still an artist manager I would appreciate the singer who comes in and says can we just think through a couple of these things uh, maybe even sing something twice you give me a little feedback you tell me what you're hearing uh, and you can also never expect uh, very very few artist managers are going to take on representation from the get-go, the moment they hear you the first time. A lot of people will then say, why don't you work on this and this and come back in two months and let's see how it develops and see how it goes. So you have to be open uh-huh. to that as a thing to do that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, how, how um, b- b- but with that, once you, that, that all assumes that you have gotten into the room with the manager. Um, right. How do you actually get in the room with the manager? What is going to help you? Is it reviews? How important are reviews and press, et cetera, et cetera? Um, wh- what do you? I mean, what do you feel? I, you know, I think if um, sure, if you have reviews, send them in with your package that you're sending to the artist manager. But same thing there. First of all, I think. Um, it's it's up to the singer to do a little bit of research and figure out what type of singers are on what type of roster, so that you can mm. uh, there you know there are artist managers who are just not going to take the time with a young singer because they are so heavily laden with uh, very successful singers already that they they simply lack the time and then it's a wasted effort to try to get onto that roster. There are singers where there are rosters who have a very particular um, preference of singers and you can any singer who, who knows the other singers by reading through their list can figure out a little bit if they think they might be a good fit um, and th- but then um, I think same thing there reviews are important but I think much more important is uh, if you have a, a coach a voice teacher a conductor you've worked with previously uh, who was impressed with your work and offers to help then ask mm-hmm. them to make it ask them to to make the initial approach on your behalf so that there's always already a reference mm-hmm. it's so much easier for artist managers to go through all the materials if they if it's someone they trust someone they know who says look just take 10 minutes and listen to that or take 15 minutes listen to that singer at the end of the day if you have someone can do that for you it's much much easier and it's more okay, important no. i believe than now, I want to I want to ask you about something that I know is, is actually just popped into my mind because somebody wrote a question about it that I find is very interesting. YouTube, and what I find most interesting that I want to ask you about YouTube is because of the fact that I know that there was a period, there was one time in the past, was it your your count in No City Figaro a few seasons back, right? Right. right. Where you actually cast a role from YouTube, having never heard the singer live. Is that true? Correct. That's that's true. And it, it actually also happened from, uh, it was a discovery we made not even from searching for that singer. It was someone who happened to be in a performance of someone else for whom we were looking uh, for, for video material online and caught, mm-hmm. the, caught the other singer as well. And then obviously did our homework. Even, we, even if we had never heard him live, we did our homework called the theaters mm-hmm. where he where he sung before, called the people we trusted to say, look, is this, um, is this as good as we thought it was? Or is this as interesting as we thought it was? And the people we oh. trusted confirmed that, and so we actually did indeed, indeed do it that way. And so, was yes, it what, successful? What's online about you is important. It was very successful. Um, the return, honestly, was not quite that successful. So, um, huh. but the first role was very, but the first role was very successful. By the second time, mm, their the attitude had changed a little bit uh, from by that singer, and so it wasn't huh. quite so successful. But yeah, it's. I mean, it brings up a good point. Obviously, it is very, very important what's out there about you, and it's up to the singer to continuously check um, to see what pops up. If someone pirated something, if someone 
put up a, a, a YouTube excerpt of your singing that you would rather not, not have up there, then contact them and have it taken down. And if you upload your own things, really make sure that it's, it's good singing. It's not so much the quality of the video, because you can hear through a, a recording quality whether it's there. But if, it's, if it wasn't such a good day, don't put it up by thinking, oh, it's good enough. They will hear the quality of the voice and that'll be enough. It's not. There I have to uh -huh. say, I think it's really, the, it's really the singer's responsibility to make sure that what is up there is, is up to the standards of that singer, is musical, is technically good, is engaging, has something to say. Don't just put it up there to have five bars in which you sang well and hope that people will then say, oh, from these five bars, I can hear the quality of the voice. The rest of it isn't so great. Because then that's, that's not the image you want to give out. So so I'm imagining that what you're saying is that uh, that you you check YouTube for artists when they're mentioned. Does that mean even when an agency is sending you someone, you check their YouTube? Or do you go to their website? How useful is a website as opposed to just YouTube clips? Um, they're about equal. Obviously, website is very useful. It's, um, it's uh, you know, some people simply link to YouTube. Some people have uh, different excerpts on the, up there that are not on YouTube. Um, what we do is, especially when, when artist managers make submissions for certain roles, we may quickly get a first impression uh, on YouTube. Most of the time, if it's a really important part and we don't know that thing, we will still try to travel somewhere where we can hear them live or we will mm -hmm. try to uh, hear them in audition. I do think that, um, that uh, you know, I, even with, with budgets um, the way they are currently, a lot of general directors and artistic directors still travel and still try to go hear singers in performance so that they can get a sense of their overall um, performance ability rather than just, uh, rather than just um, an audition. Uh huh. Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, so, a little bit of a shift here that goes back to um, back a little bit to the management things that your Gita had written here, sure. um, and then we can uh, and, and then we can move on to actually a completely different shift that will deal with more how you work as a general director. Um, does it make more sense to have two or three different managers around the world, especially for those based in Europe and other parts of the world, or is it better to have one that deals with everything, and at which level do you think it matters that you kind of consolidate into one place? Um, I, I think it can be very helpful to have more than one manager, one in the States, one in Europe at the beginning. There's a lot of, there is a lot of work that a manager uh, will do if he, ta he or she takes you onto their roster um, and if you're still young. And they will, they will only have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of work that they can, that they can really do for you. So I would absolutely suggest that at the beginning to have, when, it, when you're not necessarily going to be singing in all the major houses only, to have various managers. Europe is a little bit freer in many ways in terms of how these management situations function. Um, in the States, few singers have more than one manager for the US, um, but mm -hmm. I, would, I would absolutely suggest having one, one in each uh, location at, at least. You might want to have, who knows, you may want to talk to people also in, in uh, you know, uh, we're talking U.S. and Europe heavily right now, um, but obviously the, there's a whole other market in Australia, in Asia, in, in, in uh, other mm -hmm. parts of the country where I think it's always helpful to have more than one manager. You just have to make sure that these managers communicate well with each other. And um, I do think that as... Um, you know, as the career progresses, if it gets to the point where you're starting to have major recurring performance opportunities in big houses, then you might want to think about consolidating so that it's really guided or at least um, having one uh, major agent who is generally representative for you so that everything is guided by one person, maybe with the help of others. But then I think it becomes much more important, especially now, 
to maybe have a to have a, a PR manager also or a sort of a marketing mm. specialist with whom you work a little bit rather than many agents in many places in the world. But I think that only comes after the initial success after you've had a couple uh, when you sing in the big houses. But then or how do you deal you get for taken on by a no, no, no. For example, sorry, it's the, it's that that transcontinental lag. Sometimes I'm not just being a rude interrupter, um, but uh, well, sometimes I am. But uh, for example, you as a theater, as a casting entity, as a producer, does it bother you if you're submitted the same name by multiple management? Because these days, even smaller management in Germany will work internationally. Um, and how do you handle, for example? If you get some other, if you get a name submitted by three management, how do you deal with that? Or does it annoy you? Does it make you want to stop dealing with that singer because it might be complicated? No, no, certainly not. If we're interested in that singer, then uh, whether there's one or three managers to deal with, it doesn't matter to us. We will, however, um, uh, assign the, them to make a choice and let us know through whom they want to go. I mean, we if if two managers suggest the same singer, then we will mm -hmm. normally write to both and say, look, this was suggested, this was suggested. It's not my call to say I'm going to work with you or with you if both managers are equal. If it's a European mm -hmm. manager and a U.S. manager, then obviously we simply work with the U.S. managers. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's a problem. I, I And I don't think... Um, I don't think any if um, I don't think any house is um, uh, would say I'm not going to work with this singer because I may have to deal with one or two agents more at once. I mean nowadays, mm -hmm. it, it, same thing there. If, if biggest, you know, the, as long as you don't start to fall into the trap of playing games and you're just honest and immediately say, look, and twice, who does this engagement go through? You guys figure it out then mm -hmm. it's very simple. I don't uh -huh. think it's a, it's, it's, it's not a, it's not a negative for a singer to have more than one manager. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Now let's, let's make a shift because I want to actually, you, you are in a very unique position that many artists don't quite understand necessarily just simply because we spend so much of our time as an artist thinking about getting the agent, getting the job, how to prepare to better get the job. Um, the, a question would be, as a general director, what do you spend your day doing? Um, as opposed to when you were an artistic administrator, you spent your day doing artistic things and thinking of casting. Now, as a general director running an opera company, how do you set the season? How do you set the, the tone of the theater and all of that? What do you do? <laughs> Good question. Uh, well, yeah, it's it's changed a bit, obviously. Um, in terms of the setting of the season, it uh, we set it along the guidelines that we set for ourselves of saying we want to. Uh, it's in, in this shift that happened over the past three years, where we said we want to start to be more international. We want to have more operas of um, uh, of different repertoire. We don't want to have only standard repertoire. We want to try to have a little bit of uh, English opera. We want to try to do uh, American works. So that we, we also, realistically speaking, we said we want to always have one that's a bit of a blockbuster that helps us uh -huh. offset the risk to then take with an, an opera that's not so well known. We always want to have a comedy in there uh, so that we can, so that we can um, uh, not always show only uh, big dramatic uh, the soprano dies at the end opera moments but also fun stuff to to educate our audience so we and that's where for example in this season with with Macbeth has never has not been done in Palm Beach so we said this is something we really want to do uh, Barbara Seville serves the purpose of the blockbuster and the comedy Hells of Hoffman serves the purpose of having something in French so it's not just Italian opera next season we're doing a world premiere of an American opera so that that's uh, we we try to just have a very very broad variety, but that obviously depends on the mission of the of the opera house, depends on the um, the board, depends on the audience. 
Um, we have uh, have a lot of work to do to push a newer repertoire into our seasons, so it's going to be slow going. In terms of mm-hmm. daily activities, obviously, it's um, casting is a lot of the fun part still, together with the director of artistic operations. But a lot of my day now, of course, is spent with um, uh, in, in in board management, in fundraising, in uh, uh, marketing discussions in even event planning to make sure that everything that we do really works out throughout the season. The majority mm-hmm. of it, I think, I would, I would say certainly has to do with board members, spending a lot of time with board members as they in the, in the U.S. become the biggest ambassadors for the companies and raising money. In the end, uh, here it's all based on private fundraising. And, uh, and, and, you know, and that's where a lot of artists can be very helpful, honestly. I think uh, there I have to say I'm not sure um, how the training is different now in Europe. In the States, it's certainly such that uh, all young singers are very well advised if they can um, also have personalities that lend themselves to being in a room with a donor. Uh, and, and, and so they can learn to, how to talk about their craft so they can explain to a donor what it means to go through school, what it, how much money they spend on, on tuition in order to get their, uh, their degrees and their education, how much a voice lesson costs, how, so that they can be helpful to the theaters in raising money for future production. I mean, we've, we've always tried to have singers here who, or we've always, rather, we've always asked our singers to be part of certain receptions so that our donors can meet the singers right after performance or, or over a lunch, so that there's a, a better mm-hmm. sense of understanding between audience and artist. I'm not sure that's the case in Europe uh, quite that much, but certainly in the U.S. it's become very normal. Uh-huh. So would you, how much influence across the U.S. do you think that board members and donors actually have on the casting of opera or on the choosing of which operas that you do? Um, on the casting of opera, I think very little. Uh, I do think that most boards, and if they're well-trained boards, they will trust the, the artistic leadership of the house to make the right decision. And they will get the confirmation by seeing who's, who's coming to the opera house. Um, mm-hmm. I think the, the, a lot of boards have strong preferences over the type of titles that are being presented. But there as well, they, they certainly, um, most of them trust the, the, um, the leadership to make the right decisions. However, if we, for example, have, we've now put together a five-year artistic plan again, where mm-hmm. in some of the time slots, because we, we also said we want to work a little bit more in advance, where in some of the times where we said, okay, in this season, we could do this one or this one, um, there I will be honest enough to say if suddenly someone says, oh, I would love to see this opera, I will underwrite it, then we'll do mm-hmm. that one in that season. Then mm-hmm. maybe push the other one into the next. So there's a certain influence from donors over season planning, but only, um, but only in maybe making a choice between two titles that are both uh, in line with the artistic vision of the house. I see. I see. So to jump back into some things that uh, that people have asked to get back into kind of the, the the nitty gritty of getting those jobs, you mentioned at the very beginning um, that knowing how to sing is the most important yeah. thing that somebody gets in that transition. There, what does that mean for you? Technically, you were a singer, so what does it mean? Um, a good technique, a good singer? It, it means that, but honestly, it means that it sounds easy, it looks easy, it makes me comfortable, it makes me sit back, relax, and enjoy a person singing, which then in turn, of course, means it must be, it must be anchored, the breath support must be there, the resonance must be there, the voice has to be even from top to bottom, the 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 so that it has to be solid enough so that the singer can then play with nuances in the aria without going off of the center of the voice it it absolutely and i know this is going to sound redundant 
but it absolutely must be on pitch. I cannot tell you how many times uh, singers are not singing on pitch. And <laughs> I don't quite, un I mean, yes, I remember sometimes you, you have bad days, you have good days. But a lot of it is just um, uh, people who've not studied the languages enough to figure out what the vowel placement means, what, what it means to line up the, the vowels correctly so that the pitch doesn't suffer, um, so that the, the, the breath control that creates a very even vibrato from top to bottom that doesn't distort the pitch or the sound. Um, all these things obviously come together in the end. And that's, but in the end, you know, I mean, that's what, that's what tells you whether a singer is, uh, whether that works or not. And if, if you can, if, if I can sense or hear or see that the, the, the neck is all strained or the, the, the breath support isn't there or the, uh, the singer is struggling, then that's going to make any audience incredibly uncomfortable. And it will make it uh, very difficult for the singer to work within uh, the, the framework that a director or conductor will ask for them. Um, mm -hmm. So that's what that means to me. Uh-huh. Very, very interesting. Now, I have to say that I want, I want to actually... It seems... Go ahead. Sorry, no, a lot of it really seems redundant. And, but if I, if I didn't continuously see that, I wouldn't say it, right? Every, mm -hmm. And I see some of the comments going by and saying, of course it should be in pitch, and uh, <laughs> uh, right? Of course it should be. Yeah. But I cannot tell you how many people are continuously not singing on pitch. And, uh, yeah. you know, I'm not sure if it comes from singing in small rooms primarily, where it's difficult for the singers to hear themselves, where it's difficult for them to figure out what um, what physical sensation corresponds with what type of sound um, but it's something mm -hmm. that singers just have to be aware of that it's it's it it will catch the attention of everyone it's not on pitch yeah I mean I I have to second that in saying that a lot of the things that people think um, are good uh, people that people think are the normal things that you shouldn't ever have to be bothered with wondering about Actually, I think that that you would be quite surprised, like the singing on pitch, et cetera, is very, it's hard because that's not, uh, that, that happens all the time. People don't sing on pitch. People take, take liberties that, I mean, for me, I can say this is one of the things I've always noticed. There are certain things that everybody that produces opera has to deal with the conductor of that opera because you've got an orchestra when you're doing things. And there's probably not one, not many things that is more glaring when you are listening to it in an audition than somebody that is taking liberties with the tempo and with the music in a way that will make your conductor sit in your office every day complaining about a singer that doesn't follow and doesn't pay attention. That you have to do, you, you do have to look at it and listen to the fact that the, the conductor has to deal with not just you, but also the orchestra. You can't just do whatever you feel like at any given moment. Um, do you find that in the U.S., because obviously in Germany especially, but in a whole lot of places, um, the Fox system is very strong. Do you find that that is the case still in the, in the U.S.? Do you think that it's better if, if someone sticks to a certain Fox? Or is it, I mean, how flexible are you? There was an earlier question that we never got to that would be very good. To deal with, which is um, which is Zwischenfach, um, especially a high mezzo that's also singing Don Elvira and things like that. How do you how do you categorize those, and does it bother you if you see somebody that's kind of a little bit riding on all different sides of the fence? <laughs> so um, no, it certainly it doesn't bother me. It's um, you know I think in many ways this whole Fach situation is. Um, uh, I think it's over overvalued. It's not as important as it, it as it seems, provided you uh, you orient yourself towards down again, uh, so so that you don't. Mm -hmm. um, it's important. It's important that you understand the limits of your voice, and therefore can choose repertoire that's appropriate, um, keeping in mind that you always want to sing with reserves. 
that you never want to sing where you have to give full throttle all the time. So in that sense, yeah, it's important that you choose roles that are not too big for you. Too small, I don't think it exists. I, I honestly don't think that there's any kind of, of way of saying um, this is the wrong fach. If it's if a, if, a, if a bigger soprano can sing Turandot and still can sing Don Anna and still can sing something lighter, why not? Most likely it's not going to happen. But uh, so I don't think mm -hmm. it's that important. For the Zwischenfach, same thing there. It just becomes a matter of, um, I think it just becomes a matter of, of preference within the business. And so unfortunately for the people who are a little bit on, on writing on, on uh, who can do many things, mm -hmm. they need to do their homework and see how these theaters cast, what type of roles that they put singers in that may have a similar uh, type of voice because there is really no strict rules about it, in my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, a question that came here, which is, why do you think that theaters are reluctant to hear unmanaged singers? Um, partially, I think it is because there's a, there's a, a sense of, again, there's, there's a sense of a little bit of, um, Free selection that happens if someone is managed. There's a little bit of a stamp of approval where you think, ah, oh, okay, if at least that singer has caught the attention of so and so, then there's probably something there that is worth for me to listen to. That's sometimes the case and sometimes not. Uh, even there, obviously, the opinions are uh, differ greatly. Um, part of it, quite honestly, simply has to do with. Um, with time, if I would love to hear uh, every singer, I, I, I love hearing singers and uh, finding new That's people. True. Sometimes we just don't quite have enough time to do that within the periods in which we can uh, hold auditions. And then you start to make pre-selections based on, again, some trust criteria um, and are maybe less, less uh, willing to take a chance on someone unmanaged. Mm -hmm. But same thing. But, but, but do you there, think if, you know if unmanaged? Go ahead. No, no, no. But then the question is, is, is whether or not you, in general, the business, not you personally, but in general, the business feels that unmanaged singers are second-rate artists or second-class citizens in some sense, or is it really just about time? Um, well. No, there is. I'm sure there is a sense of that because, again, if if um, every uh, if all the different positions in the business are doing their job right, then mm -hmm. yes, a singer who has their their technique, their languages, their interpretation, their sense of what they have to say together will have caught the attention of someone who's doing their job as a coach, as a conductor, as a manager and therefore find their way onto a roster, which means if mm -hmm. all these people are doing their jobs, it, me it says to me that there's a certain value there. And because of that, obviously, there is a sense that if someone is uh, unmanaged, uh, I, I only now say a number to say a number, please, if someone is on the phone at exactly that age, uh, that doesn't mean that that's the give all and end all of ages. But if, if someone is unmanaged at 40 and wants to come sing Turandot but has never caught the attention of any manager, I'm probably going to question that a little bit. And if I have time, I'll take the risk. And if I don't have time, then I will say, if that's the voice that should be singing Turandot and it has been in the business for the past 15 years and has not attracted the attention of anyone in the business whom I trust in the past 10 years, mm -hmm. then maybe that that's not the right person for me. And, uh, and and what do you say? Like Cynthia wrote from Berlin here, what do you say when somebody asks you why you don't have a manager, if they hear you and they like you? Um, I, I would, I mean, it seems to me that that's a little bit the moment where you say, well, why don't you think of who you could call for me if you like my singing, like you had said earlier. Correct. Absolutely. Is it, I mean, I, I just want to make sure I understood the question correct. Like, what do you, how, if, what if happens if the singer comes to sing for you? you? If, yeah. 
and you think they're fantastic and it doesn't add up, which has happened. We we all know that. We've heard that many times. Right. Someone who sings right. for you and it doesn't add up that they're not having a career, that they don't have a manager. What's going on here? Uh, obviously, in my opinion, I'd be honest. Let's get it all out there. The first thing you wonder is, what am I not hearing? Are they just having a great day? Maybe they're really there's something wrong. But then you start thinking, but look, I've tried to poke holes in that. It's solid technique. It's solid singing. Why don't you have a manager? So, what do you, what does the singer say to somebody like that? Um, I think it. I mean, I'll get to the singer in a second. But I think these are probably the most exciting moments in the business, right? When you I actually agree. when you suddenly hear a, a talent where you realize, wow, this is incredible. How come this has not attracted the attention of people yet? And um, I, in that sense, as a, you know, if, if, um, if the person who hears you is really intent on saying, oh, come on, why do you not have a manager? What's going on here? What's wrong? Then, yeah, I would probably say, well, it, it, the timing hasn't lined up yet. I approached two, three managers. They haven't had a chance yet to listen to me. Uh, if you could suggest someone who I should approach, I would greatly appreciate it. And if you're even, based on your positive feedback, willing to make a phone call on my behalf, that would be terrific. Um, I think that's that's a great chance for the singer to say, for the help of whoever just gave them that compliment. Yeah. Um, one question that came up earlier that I think is, is interesting to touch, especially in reference to, you were talking about... Um, board management and fundraising and all of that, somebody had asked about the possibility of finding personal sponsors, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, have, in your experience, how, how does one go about doing that? How does it help? What is it that you're asking them to help sponsor? Um, how can that be useful along the way? Um, you know, I think there's you can't, uh, you can't sort of set off and say, I'm going to go find myself a patron. Uh, or, or, a, <laughs> or a donor. Unfortunately, I think That's you right. can't. <laughs> but what you can do, if if it does happen with within within a company, um, if through two three times where you've had contact with, with with people, I've seen it happen a lot because you know I think a, a lot of the board members, a lot of wealthy people in the U.S. they who have an interest in the arts have an interest in seeing their support go directly to the singer. And th th that will not lessen their support to the opera house, but they will take on a singer and they will, uh, you know, I think it's it, there. The singer has to figure out a little bit uh, how that relationship is developing when it's, when it's um, appropriate to ask for something. Or if maybe you ask the, whoever was at the opera house who was the intermediary, to act on your behalf and say, would you mind asking so and so if they would sponsor a a, a plane ticket so I could go do this audition, or would they be mm -hmm. willing with voice lessons, or would they be willing to help with coaching? I mean, I think that's where these these relationships can can come in very 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 handy. Um, I I know many many people who who have found sponsors and were then able to take advantage of auditions which otherwise they wouldn't have because of uh, finances or were able to uh, take care of some health issues, uh, dental work, medical work, which the, the donor then helped make possible. But I think that, you know, the, as in any relationship, you just, you have to use your gut, you have to use your, your, your wits to figure out when is the right time. How how can you express your gratitude and, and be charming at the same time and and make an ask, right? That's but but is that a thing of the past? Like uh, like Ruben was said, asking, um, in your experience, have you experienced individuals that still support individual artists, or do they feel like they want to, for absolutely. example? Oh, you have. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I I know that uh, you know there are. Uh, Oftentimes they do come from young artist programs uh, because that's a, an easy way for a donor to get to know young singers. But I know that a lot of uh, patrons at the Merrill Up program continue to support their singers after they leave. Uh, Chautauqua Opera, we all used to have opera, opera parents who um, would then continue to take you out to dinner or make something possible for you. Uh -huh. Same thing in Glimmerglass. Uh, we try to do the same thing now and find sponsors for all the young artists while they're here. 
um, which if that relationship goes well through the season, then there's absolutely no reason why it should stop afterwards. So I do think there's a lot of there's a lot of interest out there of people to become sponsors of someone whom they consider very talented and would like to help them. Uh huh. So um, a quick uh, quick question with this: when we kind of just touching back on the on the management question, um, sure. as we're going to start to uh, starts to wind down a little bit. Um, does this mean that a freelance artist can't function without a manager in today's opera world? Would you say that? Um, no, no, I wouldn't say that. However, I think this is, uh, we've not talked about that yet, but I think that's where um, a freelance artist can absolutely function in this, in today's opera world, but you have to then define what that means for that singer and what type of opera project they are involved in. Um, I, you know, we've only talked so far about the, the, the path from school to young artist program to, to careers and companies and guest artists or, or being a fest mm -hmm. artist somewhere. But obviously there are, there are so many different careers in this business that um, mm -hmm. you, can, you can do plenty of operatic work. There are so many opera companies here who um, have um, who, who take unmanaged singers, singers who create their own opportunities, singers who get mm -hmm. themselves involved or together with other singers and build up uh, new companies where you can absolutely have an operatic career. It may not mm -hmm. be the one uh, to say, uh, yes, an unmanaged singer to have to only sing at the Met Covent Garden, La Scala, and Paris. Probably not, right? Mm -hmm. If we're realistic. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a very, very fulfilling operatic life, sing a lot of opera, make your living from singing opera. And that's where, you know, that's where, uh, again, we've, we've focused sort of on this fast track to the, to the big house. But I think mm -hmm. singers have to also be honest with themselves and figure out what is going to be their path. Take a risk, do some new work work with a composer, work with a new, new, um, a new director, um, be okay with the fact that if you want to be a working singer, then you have to be happy just being a working singer and don't always think that your, um, your career or your worth is tied to the size of the house in which you're singing. And mm -hmm. through through taking on um, these kinds of, uh, you know, maybe you sing a couple 20th century works, make sure you're a good musician and focus on that. Maybe you enjoy it. Maybe you, as you do more of it, you get to enjoy it more. Suddenly you're known for something and suddenly that leads back to a path of singing more traditional work. And so it's more a matter of the, the path of work and life rather than managed or unmanaged, I think. Uh-huh. Then, so that would mean, for example, somebody had brought this up, and many we we know that, especially in the United States, I don't think it really happens in Europe, but in the United States, there are a lot of managers and not unrespected managers that charge a monthly fee. Um, artists like to call it retainers. Managers like to call it uh, uh, what do they call it? Uh, expense fees. Um, what do you feel about that? Yeah, administrative fee. What is your feeling about? retainers being charged, so to speak? You know, I think they are, uh, they're okay at the beginning. We never did. Guy and I, when, when, when I worked with Guy Barthelay, he from the beginning said, look, I will, I, this is not my philosophy. And I agreed. I said, it's not our philosophy to take uh, a commission, uh, a, a retainer. If we believe strongly enough in the singer, then we'll work and make it happen. But the reality is also that, especially when you're a young singer, um, the the amount of work that it takes for the artist manager to generate work in the beginning is obviously much greater. You say, it, at least in the old days, you used to send out many more things. You had to, mailings and and headshots and all kinds of things that you were responsible for to to send out. And so I think mm -hmm. it's okay to say, if it if it's a system where you say for the first year. Why don't we say for the first year, you cover a little bit of all my time that I put into it, because most likely it's going to take a year for you to get a first contract anyways. And after mm -hmm. that, 
um, for example, there's uh, several people have maybe the system that uh, you have a certain retainer, but if you start to make enough money so that the commission covers that, then you then you no longer pay the retainer. So I think it's mm -hmm. okay if it's a gradual disappearance of the retainer and more and more then goes onto the commission system only. Uh -huh. But I wouldn't say for more it, uh, than a year, you know. Yeah, it always struck me that the yeah, it always struck me that it makes sense when somebody they have to pay. You want them to not be worrying about how to pay their phone bill when they're working for you, so they do have to pay. What do you think is it a reasonable amount that you would pay someone? Um, having done that business, what do you think is a reasonable amount? Uh, that's a hard, that's a hard question. Um, Hundred dollars, fifty dollars. Only, only because, yeah, only because I've been uh, gone from it for a while, and I guess it depends on the the whether the artist manager is primarily working out of their home, if they're renting an office space, uh, how what their website, what what their web hosting fees are. I don't how many think, people on I mean, the roster are paying them. How many people? Are, how exactly? How many young artists are you willing to take on and asking for a fee? I don't think I would, as a singer. I would not feel that it's the right path to take if someone charged me more than maybe a hundred dollars maximum a hundred and fifty probably I would say a hundred dollars a month because you should i think anyone who has the best interest of a young singer at heart will realize that you cannot ask a singer to pay more than that at the beginning of a career i agree i agree um I have to say um just to answer one thing that's going on in the discussions here, and then I want to ask one last question, and then, then we will wrap things up. I believe, just for those of you that are talking about the very large amounts per month, you're probably talking about someone that is a, uh, that is a, a publicist, not just a manager, just so that you know that information. Um, thank you. I was about to ask that, but I, I just noticed that Ruben sent it to everyone instead of just to me, which is... I do have to say that we are very proud that actually Daniel has been very good at casting people from NIOP auditions um, throughout the time, and it's, it's, it's a very good thing. Um, I want to, before we draw to a close, a couple of final little things here. Um, one, I'm sorry about the, the whole survey thing because it's the first time we've ever used it, and it seems to be a little bit of a pain more than anything that it kind of pops up and goes away before you can answer. What I will do is when we're done, um, I'll send you all just a little thank you email and put in some of these things. And if you don't mind just dropping a, an answer back to them for us, because it's helpful. I promise it's not like I'm going to be writing you tons of questions. Uh, Joseph, you had asked the question before we go away, the visa question of whether or not you need a visa to do auditions. This is what you're mentioning, right, Joseph? Um, because Daniel actually wrote back to that to say that to, you don't need a visa to do auditions. Um, no, so write, write the question again, Joseph, quickly, and we'll make sure to get to um, it. I uh, to getting it was in order to get engaged, yeah. And I, I'm sorry, Joseph, I, I started to type and then I got into another question. Yes, for the audition, you don't need a visa. You can do that on a tourist visa. Obviously, to in order to work, to get the engagement, you have to have a visa. Now, um, quite honestly, it's become easier for companies to uh, get visas again a little bit. Five years ago, it was very difficult for, for regional companies to get their requisite uh, visas, work permits. Um, it's a little bit different now. The, the immigration services have made it a little bit easier again. But um, you still, it's still a bit, you, you take a risk because you do, it does cost the, the company um, at least an additional five hundred dollars to then apply for your work, work visa if you can't have one yourself, and um, um, and the visas all are based on um, what's called an O1 visa, a, a visa for an artist of extraordinary ability, and we have to we as a company have to be able to prove that um, uh, that the singer has already had a lot of recognition in the field. We have to submit an application together with a lot of reviews, uh, re uh, possibly um, uh, primarily newspaper reviews, no recordings at this point. Um, and then they will, they will decide 
whether or not uh, they consider that to be, they being the immigration services, whether or not they consider that, that singer to be of, of enough status that they give you the visa. We've never had anyone turned down. Uh, I have to say that we, we are a, one of the regional companies that actually get a lot of visas. And um, we've always ha had our visas approved. So if you, if you impress the company enough in your audition, they will get a visa for you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so quickly, um, before we sign off, I want two, two last things to say and one last question here. Um, one, I want to let everybody know, thank you for taking part in this. Um, tomorrow uh, or Monday, well, tomorrow is Monday, I forgot it's not Saturday, I'm going to announce uh, the webinar for next week, and it's actually going to be um, with an artist manager that's probably one of the more amazing uh, people in the business. Um, I have to get his final confirmation tomorrow, but I can tell you that he is the person that more or less created and guided Anna Natrebko. Um Daniel certainly knows who that is now, and it is going to be fascinating to, to hear the inside mind of somebody that took Anna Natrebko from a very can't do it because then, then I'd be speaking before he confirmed. Anyway, coming up, the first auditions that we're kind of doing this fall in Vienna on the 16th, 17th, and 18th of November, where the Teatro di Capitol Toulouse, Teatro Municipal di Santiago, Chile, Maggio Musicale, uh, Festival Martina Franca, Dallas Opera, Vlaams Opera, Antwerp, Theater an der Wien, and the Cologne, Köln Opera House will all be there listening. All of that information is online at nyop.com. If Daniel were there, he'd be hiring singers again. Um, and uh, what I want to do here, for those of you in the U.S., you know about a program called, uh, called Inside the Actor's Studio. And at the end of that program, James Lipson, who interviews everyone, he always asks a questionnaire for people. Um, and it's a very fascinating, it's based on the Proust questionnaire, and I think it's a very interesting thing. And I would like to get, um, like to get his, uh, um, his answers to some things. So here is our questionnaire, and I've just adapted it all for, for opera. What is your favorite opera, Daniel? Um, Macbeth. Ah, plugging the season. Um, <laughs> what is your least favorite opera? My least favorite opera? Um, probably La Boheme, even though it gets me every time, and even though it's going to be in the repertoire again soon, but it's not, it's probably my least favorite opera. Uh, now what turns you on about opera? Ah, the talent of the people in it. Uh-huh. Now, what turns you off? What turns me off about opera? About opera. Uh, the, the, the sort of the terrible old-fashioned conventions that people have in their mind and the fact that we always have to apologize for opera. Interesting. Now, what character in what opera would you most like to be? Florestan in Fidelio. <laughs> it's all about the fees. Um, right. what, character in, what character in opera would you least like to be? Probably Despina. If I had to be Despina, that wouldn't work out so well. <laughs> Poor Despina. What is your very favorite operatic expression? Silencio. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Airline pilot and architecture. Wow. Okay. And what profession would you not like to attempt? Uh, uh, running night up? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Great. Now here's our last question. If heaven exists, what character from which opera would you like God to be when you arrive at the pearly gates? 
arrived at the pearly gates. Hope it's not Scarpia. I think no, I think Figaro from the marriage of Figaro. Yeah. It'd be in good hands then. Yeah. Yeah. That is a good one. Daniel Biaggi, we thank you for this time. I thank you to everyone else for taking part in this. I hope it's been useful. Every week we're going to be doing this. You can find it online at niop.com forward slash webinars. And check in anytime. If you have questions, drop us questions. If you have ideas, let us know. We're here to help you. And thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, very much. Thank you to all of you. It was a great pleasure. And as I, as I typed, if anyone would like to write, please do. I'll try to get back to everyone. It may not be within 24 hours, but I'm always happy to help if I can. Wonderful. Uh, Michael, write me. This is fine. We can do uh, the whole idea of pricing these things, just to touch on base. It's all new. We don't know what we're trying to do. We, we need to provide this service, and we're trying to figure out a way to do it. You can always reach any of us at info at niop.com. If you don't have Daniel's email on hand, then drop us an email and we'll forward it to Daniel and make sure that he gets it. When I end the meeting, you're going to be automatically directed to a page with a four-question survey, and it would be very, very useful to do this. Affordable is the key, Enrique. Affordable but informational is the most important thing. And we're doing the best we can. So thank you all for supporting this. And uh, we hope to see you again in about a week. So take care of everyone. Ciao, ciao. Thank you. Bye.